Welcome, welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie de Rosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. I am speaking to you from Massey College, which is located on indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and also the great privilege that I have to continue to work here. Today is a very special presentation that uh, we want to make, and it's a presentation entitled The History of the Mississaugas. We are still here, and I'm delighted that we'll have uh, Darren Wabanga to lead us to this presentation. It's an important presentation for the Massey community to listen to for two reasons. Number one, the Mississaugas of the Credit have a, an office at Massey, and uh, we continue to be partners in delivering some joint programmings together. And secondly, the chapel at Massey College has been renamed in 2017, which means that it's the, it was designated by the queen as a chapelle royale which means that it's there to symbolize the important relationship that the Crown and the Indigenous had in treaty making. So I think uh, it's incumbent on all members of the Massey community to know the story of the Mississaugas. And that is today why we invite Darren Wabanga to help us go through it. So he is working as a traditional knowledge and land use coordinator for the Mississaugas of the Credit Department of Consultation and Accommodation. His, his work consists in doing education project on the history of the Mississaugas, history of the treaty land, the territory, and the people. He served 10 years as the librarian of his community. And uh, prior to that, prior to working for the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, he was an educator in elementary schools in Southern Ontario. He specialized in history and geography, served as a vice principal and as a curriculum coordinator. So welcome, Darren, and thank you so much for doing this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for the uh, kind introduction, of course. Thank you for the uh, land acknowledgement. It's uh, it's wonderful to be here with you at uh, today. I'm coming to you from uh, the Mississauga, the Credit First Nation, just outside of Hagersville, Ontario. For those of you not familiar with us, uh, we're the treaty holders for the lands in the Toronto area. And it's uh, it's my job this afternoon to make you acquainted with our history and who we are as a people. I entitled our talk, uh, We Are Still Here, because in many ways, people have forgot who the original people are, who the Mississaugas of the credit are. It's uh, We have a small population, but at one time, controlled much of the Golden Horseshoe area that uh, encompasses Toronto, Hamilton, and uh, all the way around the lake. So without further ado, I'll get us uh, started with our uh, presentation this afternoon. And uh, hopefully you'll become acquainted with who we are. And uh, perhaps I can become uh, more acquainted with you folks. And uh, and we can walk on this uh, path of uh, reconciliation that so much has been said about in the last uh, few days. So if you look at the first slide that we have up here, it has our oh, back up to the there we go. Wonderful. The first slide that we have up here, it is our the logo of the First Nation. And you'll notice it has uh, an eagle in the center, but that is the predominant clan at one time in our history. Most of our people belong to the eagle clan. Many of our people still belong to clans today. Uh, but but uh, not so much the eagle. I belong to the bear clan, for example. Other people belong to uh, the turtle clan, and others birch bark clan. Uh, so a variety of clans, and clans just a social organization, how we organized ourselves back in the day. Uh, you notice there's three fires on our logo. That indicates that the Mississaugas of the credit are part of the three fires confederacy. One fire represents the Ojibwe people. The second fire, represents the Potawatomi people and the third fire the Potawatomi uh, the third fire the uh, 
Ado Adawa people. So members of the Three Fires Confederacy. And you'll notice that our logo is uh, blue lettering on it. And that indicates that as Mississauga people, we have always had a deep connection to the waters. And in our history, except uh, until very recently, actually, we've always, always lived on uh, the banks and creeks of rivers flowing into major bodies of water. But you'll see that as we go on to our story. So if we advance to the next slide, wonderful. So the Mississaugas really, we are a subgroup of the Ojibwe nation. And in Ojibwe, the language that we speak, uh, we call ourselves the Anishinaabe, and that's a word simply meaning human beings or people. And uh, the Mississauga, the term Mississauga is not a name that we came up with for ourselves. It actually came to us through the settler folks. And it just generally means the Ojibwe people living on the North Shore of Lake Erie and the North Shore of Lake Ontario. Uh, but like I said, not a name that we've given given to ourselves. So let's let's go on. Next slide. Wonderful. So we have our own migration story and we're not going to go on with that today but uh, initially we did start on the atlantic coast or according to oral tradition and in response to an ancient prophecy that uh, the settlers were coming from across the great salt sea that we were to escape the influences of their arrival and so we were to go down the saint lawrence and eventually migrate into the Great Lakes region. And so this is the lay of the land in Southern Ontario, 1632, uh, pardon me, 1634, when we were first encountered by the French explorer, Jean Nicolette. And this is our location. We were on the North shore of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, and you can see us up there. And down below in the Southern part, of Ontario, you'll see the lay of the land. You have the Huron Wendat situated in Lake Simcoe area, and they're controlling the area around Toronto. To the west of those folks, you have the Putun or Tobacco Indians. And below them, you have the Neutral Indians, if you want to think uh, Brantford area, Kitchener area, Waterloo area, uh, Hamilton area, right around the lake to Grimsby, actually, and uh, St. Catharines. So that's the lay of the land in southern Ontario. And there's also another main actor in our story this afternoon, and that's the Haudenosaunee folks. You uh, know them in modern times as the Six Nations. Uh, you might know them as the Five Nations. Uh, and uh, also know them as the Iroquois. So I'll use that name interchangeably for them. But that's the lay of, lay of the land in Southern Ontario. And we were all at this time engaged in the fur trade. In Southern Ontario, if you notice, we've, uh, the Mississaugas, the Wendat, the Neutral, the Pretend, were all engaged with the French, the French fur trade. And we all know the French located along uh, the St. Lawrence, Montreal, Trois-Rivières, Quebec. Uh, we're engaged in the fur trade with the French. And we often want to say nasty things about our, our encounters with the Europeans, but they brought to our people trade goods that were very useful. They made life easier for us. If you can imagine uh, hunting a moose down with bow and arrow and then having to uh, skin it with a stone knife and then having to sew, sew uh, clothing together from that hide using uh, bone, uh, bone needles. Well, all of a sudden the Europeans come and uh, we now have guns, we have muskets, we can uh, skin the moose with uh, with an iron knife. We can cook with metal pots. We can sew with metal needles. We can even get cloth, for example, not have to rely necessarily on the moose hide. So European trade goods were a powerful, powerful inducement to us to participate in the fur trade. And so the people of Southern Ontario trading with the French, but the Haudenosaunee folks in New York State on this map, Finger Lakes region, they're trading with another group of people. Eventually it will be with the British, but in 1634, they're trading with the Dutch at this time. And they have a bit of a problem. Uh, they also like the European trade goods, wonderful things they are. 
but their beaver pelts are running out. They've hunted them, they've used them, they've traded them, but now they're running out. And so where to get good beaver pelts is the question, because the beaver pelts, of course, were a little bit more luxurious to the north, thicker fur, better for the fur trade. So the Haudenosaunee, in an attempt to wrest control of the fur trade, moved into southern Ontario. About 1649-1650, the Haudenosaunee moved into southern Ontario and displaced the Huron-Wendat, the Tobacco Indians, the Neutral. And at that time, southern Ontario becomes an Iroquois hunting ground. And the area where Massey is located, Toronto area, and indeed all of southern Ontario, becomes a hunting ground for the Haudenosaunee. And that would have been all well and fine, but the Haudenosaunee continued their attacks northward. Remember, they want to take control of that fur trade, so they keep attacking north. They move into the land of the Algonquins, they move into the land of the Mississaugas, they move into the land of the Adawa people. And initially, those people, we all fight a defensive war against the Haudenosaunee. They attack, we defend, they attack, we defend, we move back, they attack again. Eventually, the Haudenosaunee are able to make it all the way as far as Georgian Bay. Uh, pardon me, as far as Sault Ste. Marie, so quite a distance. But finally, the Mississaugas and their allies say enough is enough. In 1685, 1690, History, historians are unsure of the time. And of course, we don't have an exact time in our oral tradition. The Mississaugas and their allies counterattacked. Next, next slide, please. Right, and you can see the route that uh, the Northern Great Lakes First Nations used to attack into southern Ontario. By the way, this whole stretch of period where the Haudenosaunee wrested control of the fur trade from the uh, nations of southern Ontario, we know those as the age of the beaver wars. Uh, very, very, very nasty, bloody conflict. Few people realize that conflict went on in southern Ontario, but nevertheless it did, and it's really a long, continuous period of warfare that uh, you know we haven't seen since. But anyway, the Mississaugas and the Allies counterattack, 1685, 1690. And you can see the route that we took from Manitoulin Island area. And so we come down in one large grouping, attacked near Aurelia, and uh, bested the uh, Haudenosaunee there. And then we split off into two main groups. So part of the Mississaugas, split off and went down the Trans Severn waterway system and emerged in the Peterborough area. And those First Nations still live in that area today. You know them as uh, Curve Lake, uh, Scugog, uh, Alderville, and Hiawatha. Uh, they drove out the Haudenosaunee at that end of the lake. My ancestors, Mississauga of the Credit people, came down the Toronto Humber Carrying Place Trail and we drove out the Iroquois at the western end of Lake Ontario. The last battle, according to our tradition, took place at Burlington Bay. And uh, I kind of still marvel at that when I drive, drive around Burlington Bay sometimes, I think, oh, that was the last battle. So for us, a very important uh, place. So we drove out the Haudenosaunee, and according to, that la according to oral tradition in that last battle, we left two Haudenosaunee warriors alive. And they were left alive for the express purpose of telling the other Haudenosaunee people in New York State that they were to remain in New York State and that Southern Ontario was now firmly in the hands of the Haudenosaunee, of the uh, of the Anishinaabe people, whether it's the Mississaugas or the Adawa or the Potomotomy, various other Great Lakes Anishinaabe nations, but they were to, but the Haudenosaunee were to stay below Lake Ontario in their original homeland. So anyway, next slide, please. Wonderful. And so you can see the extent of the territory that the Mississaugas of the Credit 
I'm going to say it nicely, inherited at the end of the Beaver Wars. And so it's about 4 million acres of land at the western end of Lake Ontario, it includes the area where Massey is situated, where Toronto is situated, where, like I said, the whole, the whole Golden Horseshoe area. So if you look this line here, the, uh, if you can see my cursor, represents the Rouge River. And if you follow the Rouge to the west, to the top, the headwaters of the Thames River, follow the Thames River down, all the way till you get to Lake Erie, Long Point on Lake Erie, follow it around the lake shore, Niagara River, then follow Lake Ontario all the way around to the Rouge. That will give you an idea, <coughs> pardon me, of the extent of the land that we exercise, exercise stewardship and control over. And you'll notice there that we I, I list a number of river, rivers, rivers, uh, streams, and they're all important places for us because if you were to suddenly be transformed back in time, transported back in time 400 years ago, that's where you found our people living, much as we did in northern Ontario before we moved down here. We always made our homes on the, on the flats of rivers and creeks flowing into large bodies, in this case, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. We put our wigwams on the flats. We partook of the salmon fishery once we moved into southern Ontario. We planted small gardens outside of our wigwams. And then we moved off about the land in the summer and in the, and in the winters. Uh, in small family groups, actually, small family groups, uh, we're a, patriarch, a patriarchal society. Uh, it is... Uh, the, we we uh, gain our clan membership through our fathers. Uh, unlike uh, the Iroquoian people that lived here before, like the Huron-Wendat and the uh, Haudenosaunee, who are matrilineal societies, uh, we're a little bit different. So always connected to water here. And uh, so if you have been traveling throughout that territory, uh, 400 years ago, that's where you would have found us living. And we lived very lightly on the land. We did not build permanent structures. We moved with the seasons, very seasonally migrant. Uh, and we, we observed the land, the signs of the seasons well. And that's, and we made our decisions to move, move, uh, move when we observe certain signs like the budding of plants or the migration of animals or the running of the salmon very very much in tune with nature so four million acres of land now we carried on also a lively fur trade with the french and until the french were bested by the british at the plains of abraham uh then we carried on with the uh, with the british and so it was a very you know a, a, a a very prosperous time for us because we played the French and the British against each other. We learned how to trade and we did it quite well. Uh, and we're always very much interested in making a good deal for our people. Uh, and just before we go on, I want to point out number four here. And that for us, our people is our primary, our principal residence. It's uh, the Credit River, though we called it the Missanihi. Let's uh, move to the next slide, if we can. Wonderful. The Missanihi. Uh, the Credit River, as you know it today. Uh, and that was our principal river. It, it was a, remember how I said we dispersed throughout the land in the summer and in the winter? Well, once a year, no matter where we were, in our land, we would come to the Credit River in spring where we partook of the fat salmon fishery. But it was a time for us to get reacquainted with one another after being out on the land. So it was a time for ceremony. It was a time for reacquainting ourselves with one another. It was a time to talk about matters of mutual concern. It was a time to play games. It was a time to find spouses all manner of things so a very very important river for us and that's kind of how we get another part of our name mississaugas of the credit because the french built a trading post nearby about 1722 
And like I said before, we very much like European trade goods. And sometimes in the off season, and that would usually mean summer or winter, fall, spring was the time we usually partook of the of uh, trading. Uh, we would need a new we'd need a new pot or we'd need a gun or we'd need some cloth or something. And so we would go to the trader in the off season and say, can we have that good? Can we have that metal pot? And he would say, yes, go ahead. Just pay us uh, when you get your next catch of furs. And so we did that and we would pay in the spring. And so the trader extended us credit and uh, we become uh, known as the Mississaugas of the credit and the Missanihi becomes known as the credit river. There's also a bit of uh, oral tradition there that we were really good credit Indians too, because you could depend on us. If one of our uh, band members, if one of our community members could uh, not pay uh, the trader off, somebody else from the community would pay off the trade. And so we could be considered a very uh, re trusting and reliable people to do business with with, uh, with the settlers and the traders. So let's go, uh, oh, before I go on to the next slide, I just want to point out uh, on the left-hand side of, uh, of the uh, slide, you see a rather romanticized picture, but I like it anyway, because it shows wigwams. It shows us that we're on the flat of a river, uh, but it's a bit romanticized. Remember, we didn't live in teepees. We lived in wigwams that could be up and moved if we had to in, at a moment's notice. So once again, stressing that, uh, stressing that uh, seasonal mobility. And I just want to point out, if you do an archeological study in the area, you'll find very little of, Miss of the Mississaugas of the credit. We didn't leave a lot of detritus around. Uh, we didn't leave much sign. We, li uh, we lived very lightly on the land. Uh, unlike the Huron, Wendat, and the, and the Haudenosaunee folks that built long houses, uh, and that those houses, of course, are, are found even today, uh, you won't find much of us on your land. If you're ever curious about archaeology and the Mississaugas, uh, you'll be pressed hard to uh, find something, even in locations where we actually were known to be. Okay, so let's carry on to the next, uh, next slide. Uh, this, this next period, I like to call it the age of uh, treaty making. Uh, and this is where we get heavily involved with the settler period of time. Treaty is nothing new to the Mississaugas. Uh, we've been trading, First Nations have been uh, treating with each other for, for ages. War, treaties of war, treaties of peace, treaties of friendship, you name it. Treaties are nothing new to us. And initially we started out uh, amongst ourselves using wampum belts to memorialize our treaties. They helped us to remember the terms of the treaty and brought to mind the things that we had agreed to. Uh, when the Europeans came and we engaged in the treaty making process, we actually, well, treaties became more complex. And it was best to put this, the, uh, the, the, uh, the terms of the treaty actually on paper for both sides to remember. And you can see this is an, an excerpt from our Brant Track Treaty. It shows an excerpt of uh, the Brant lands around Burlington area, and it shows the dotums of our chiefs. And dotums are simply the, uh, the signatures of our chiefs. They represent the assent to the treaty. It's kind of like a signature, but not really. It also represents the, uh, the clans. Remember we talked about clans earlier? Well, here you have some dotums of some clans. I see a, a couple of otter clans here. I see a couple of eagles and I see a deer or a buffalo type clan. But uh, that's how the treaty making process changed for, for us. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. Right. And this is a close up of a wampum belt. It's a very important wampum belt. It's a, it's the uh, silver covenant chain of friendship uh, extended to us by the British in 1764. And this is a treaty of friendship. There had been a time of conflict uh, between the Great Lakes tribes, including the Mississaugas and the British after the uh, Seven Years War was concluded with the French, a period of warfare 
uh, where things had not went so well between the British and the Great Lakes tribes. And it was concluded and peace was restored. But this wampum belt was awarded to us or given to the First Nations by Sir William Johnson. He's the British uh, superintendent of the Indian Department at the time. And so wampum belt extinct, uh, showing friendship. And you can see that by the two figures right in the center of the wampum belt. One figure on the left represents the First Nations, the Great Lakes First Nations. And the other figure represents the British. And there's a bit of a joke out here among First Nations that we can always tell the British, the British figure because it has a black heart. We say that kind of tongue in cheek and it's kind of humorous to us. But really, it indicates the way the treaty making process went to us. So we're kind of serious. But the two figures holding hands indicates that we are to live in friendship on the land, that we both coexist on the land, that we're friends and allies. And so there's a it's, it's important to us. And uh, if you ever get the opportunity, look into the, the 1764 Treaty of Niagara. There's much to be learned about about uh, how land should be dispersed and who could make treaties and so on. But it's a little bit beyond us today. Uh, but uh, let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk about the treaty making process, because the treaty making process really begins in earnest between ourselves and the British at the time of the American Revolution. And we, we don't want to talk too much about the revolution because I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, how the Americans, you know, uh, were tired of, uh, of uh, taking orders from, the, from, in essence, Britain across the sea. They developed into their own people. They wanted more freedom. They wanted more say in their own matter, their own matters. And so they decided to throw off the yoke of what they deemed British oppression. And well, the revolution springs out of that. And uh, mind you, not everybody in the 13 colonies were uh, up for that. Some Americans or some people wanted to remain loyal to George III in Britain, known as loyalists. And awful things could happen to you if you were a loyalist. You could be thrown in jail. Your land could be confiscated. You could be tarred and feathered. All kinds of nasty things could happen to you. But if you could make your way north of the Great Lakes, uh, the lower Great Lakes, Lake Erie and Ontario, the British government would grant you land for your loyalty. And who had land but the First Nations? And the very first tree, uh, is with, with the Mississaugas, occurs in 1781. We call it the Mississauga Treaty of Niagara. And let's advance that slide a little bit. I think I've included that slide in here. New, well, wonderful. And it's for a strip of land, very first treaty with the Mississauga, strip of land, uh, six kilometers deep, four miles wide on the west bank of the Niagara River. The British are desperate for land to use for agriculture to feed troops farther to the west. And they also need a safe portage around Niagara Falls that isn't in enemy hands. So they conclude that treaty for us and the Mississaugas, what we received out of the deal was some trade goods, like I said before, some cloth, some, uh, some uh, fish nets, some fish hooks, uh, all kinds of gunpowder and things like that, axes. And we also received 300 British coats as part of the payment. And the man that negotiated the deal, the new superintendent of the Indian Department, is a man by the name of Sir Guy Johnson, joked with his friends at the time, I really didn't pay that much for the land. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was going to give the Mississaugas those coats for being for being allies with us during the uh, during the conflict with the Americans. So. Sir Guy really thought he was pulling a fast one on the Mississaugas, and I suppose in a way he was, but it indicated to us that the British recognized that the Mississaugas of the credit were the acknowledged stewards, occupiers, and, uh, uh, and the controllers of the western end of Lake Ontario. And the British would end up negotiating eight treaties with the Mississaugas of the credit to uh, acquire 
what they uh, what they thought were acquiring the land at the western end of uh, Lake Ontario. So let's go to the next slide. So that's the very first treaty. The second treaty is for that green blotch you see there. It's uh, that lime green, and that's for a very special group of loyalists. So all so still coming out of the American Revolution. Only well, this is for a special group of loyalists. That is for the Haudenosaunee folks. The Haudenosaunee, in particular the Mohawks, fought on behalf of the British during the American Revolution. And of course, when the British lost the Revolutionary War, Brandt, Joseph Brandt, the leader of the Mohawks of that, that time, and uh, lost their lands in New York State. They had lost their homes. They needed some place to go. And so Brandt approached Frederick Haldeman, the governor of Quebec, as Southern Ontario was part of at that time, and approached Frederick Haldeman and asked for a place that he could call home for his, for his people, for their loyalty. And Frederick Haldeman readily agreed to that and asked Brandt to select a uh, tract of land. And so Brandt did, and if you look on uh, on the slide, you'll see it's a tract of land stretching from uh, the mouth of the Grand River all the way to the headwaters of the Grand. And it's a strip of land six miles on either side of the Grand River. And he selects that land and he requests that he be granted that from Governor Haldeman. Haldeman agrees, but says first he must go to the people that control and occupy that land, namely the Mississaugas of the Credit and he must uh, make a treaty with that land that will enable the movement of Brandt into it. And so 1784, it's later ratified in 1792, uh, the treaty is negotiated. We call it the Between the Lakes Treaty. And that enables uh, the Six Nations people to move once again into Southern Ontario. Because if you remember at the conclusion of the Beaver Wars, they were to stay in New York State, uh, but uh, they were welcomed into Southern Ontario at the conclusion of the uh, of the American Revolution, and that is how they get uh, into Southern Ontario again and uh, have a presence on the land to, to this day in the uh, Haldeman Tract, as we call it, and even farther to the west uh, around the Belleville area. At, uh, there's a number of uh, settlements there of uh, Mohawk people. So let's advance the slide again. And here we are. And so we enter into treaty into treaties. And like I said, we enter into eight treaties with the Crown. And I'm going to say this, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it, even, even today, we didn't go in with, the Mississaugas didn't go in with their eyes wide open. Uh, the sad thing is we didn't have a lot of experience with treaty making as done by the British. The French never wanted our lands. All the French, when they dealt with our people, wanted was uh, beaver pelts and maybe a place, a small patch of land to stick up a chapel or a trading post. They never wanted land to settle on. But the British were a different kettle of fish. They wanted to settle people on the land. And uh, when they came to us, we thought we were sharing the land. That's what we fully intended. We had no concept of uh, land ownership as the British did. If anything, and I even hesitate to use the word ownership, we had a communal ownership. We we all used the land, we all partook of the land, we all enjoyed its bounty, and uh, we moved about it. Uh, the British, of course, had a concept when they buy a piece of land, they own it. Lock, stock, and barrel, it's not meant for sharing. And so when those early treaties were made in, uh, in uh, 1781 at Niagara, in 1784, the between the Lake Street and even up to, we'll talk about the Toronto Purchase in a few minutes. Uh, we, we, we thought we were sharing, that we would be able to move about the land. Uh, 
carry out our hunting, our fishing, our gathering. And the settlers would, yes, do, do, do carry out their farming. They would build their villages and their towns, but we would be uh, able to move about the land and learn from the settlers and get some advantage out of it for ourselves too. But we were sadly mistaken in that uh, sharing I'm sure there was no meeting of the minds. And I'm just gonna dwell on Toronto for a second because that's only been very recently settled in our history. In 2010, our, our, last, uh, our last interaction with the Crown regarding uh, the, Toronto, uh, the, Tor the Toronto Purchase Treaty, as we call it. So let's, uh, let me think, I think I have a new slide here. Let's go on here. There we go. Wonderful. I want to I want to talk about uh, spend a little time with the Toronto Purchase Treaty to indicate there was no meeting of the minds. Most people in Toronto don't realize Treaty at, Toronto was actually negotiated twice by the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown. Uh, the first time it was negotiated was in uh, 1787. A treaty was negotiated at the Bay of Quinty, of all things, near Belleville area, and that was to sell to a park. The British thought they were acquiring lands in the vicinity of Toronto. And uh, that was all well and fine, but, you know, the, the strange thing was there was no meeting of the minds in that initial treaty. The British thought the boundaries of the treaty should be... Uh, should be Etobicoke Creek and uh, and uh, Ashbridge's Bay farther to the east. The Mississauga said the boundaries of the land treaty was, was the Humber River and uh, the Don, so a much smaller piece of land. And so even after the treaty, the initial Tr Toronto purchase was signed in 1787, the British tried to survey the land the next year. And, you know, there was, there was vast disagreements between the, the Mississaugas at the time and the British surveyor saying, no, this is not the right survey. And so the survey was, uh, was officially dropped. Uh, and later on, there was questions about what the British had actually acquired in that initial Toronto Purchase Treaty. And eventually they dug out the deed or the piece of paper purporting to be the deed. And lo and behold, they found there was no description of the land on that deed. In essence, it was a blank deed and that the dotums of our chief, our chiefs that agreed to that initial deal were all were all glued on to that deed. They weren't even actually signed by our chiefs. So that was a major irregularity and the British knew it. And as, of course, that's a bit of an embarrassment too, because here for a while, they thought they had, uh, they had acquired that land and they had made, and they had parceled out the land to settlers. And now they find, ooh, that land is under, you know, it, it's it's it was uh, the deeds dubious it's not a true deed and so there was some question about even the location of the provincial capital was on land of dubious title and so they had to renegotiate again in 1805 and that's the second toronto purchase and that's the one that we usually use uh, on our maps and so on, the second Toronto Purchase. And to try and find out the original extent of the Toronto Purchase, uh, here's what we think was the original Toronto Purchase as, as articulated by, uh, by Sir Johnson, another Johnson, another, uh, another superintendent of the department. Seems like they have a monopoly on that office. And so it's uh, the initial Toronto Purchase is 10 square kilometer or 10 square miles of land at the mouth of the Humber, 10 square miles at the uh, at uh, Lake Simcoe, and a corridor of land two miles wide or four miles wide along the Humber River. So you can see how that treaty is much different from the later, from the Toronto Purchase uh, Treaty of 1805. Uh, so two very different views, two very different treaties negotiated. And anyway, the 1805 treaty, uh, 
we only recently settled with the crown years later 2010 we initially uh, we initially filed a claim against the crown in 1986 saying that the claim that the second toronto purchase had taken more land than they originally negotiated for including the toronto islands i might add and that they had only paid a pittance for the land in question and uh, and the, the amount of land, I should point out, in that second, uh, in the Toronto Purchase of 1805, they paid 10 shillings for the land. 10 shillings for about, I believe, 250 million acres of land. Not exactly fair dealing uh, from the Crown. And uh, the Crown recognized that in uh, 2010 and settled the claim. Uh, by the way, 10 shillings today recently was just told to me uh, by another historian that it's about 30 worth about 30 dollars today so you can see how lopsided the deal was but you can see 10 treaties with the crown and all with uh very very disastrous and like i said the mississaugas of the credit did not go in with uh clearly understanding what they what they uh, signed into 1805 that's when we start to wake up and we realize we're not sharing the land as we intended to next slide wonderful uh so we're skipping a bit so we make eight treaties with the crown and we went from four million acres of land to 200 acres of land 200 acres of land that were on the, on the banks of the Credit River on the west, uh, pardon me, on the eastern banks of the Credit River. Uh, and the last treaties, like I said, we were in a very sorry state. Our land base is gone. We can no longer carry out our hunting, fishing, gathering. Uh, uh, so our people were ridden by disease, brought uh, brought about by lack of good nutrition lack of being able to move on their lands uh, by settler diseases that we had no uh, way to cope with so very disastrous for us when we initiated the uh, when the, uh, the treaty making period was initiated in 18 uh, 1781 uh, first treaty negotiated we there was 500 mississaugas of the credit in our in our in our entire treaty area in our entire territory 500. Uh, 1895, 10 years after the treaty making process, we're down to 400. 1800, 20 years after the process, we're down to about 300. By the time our last treaties were negotiated, and I'll say under duress because we were starving, uh, we were down to just under 200 people. We thought we were going to be extinct. The Crown thought we were going to be extinct. And so the last treaties that uh, we signed, like I said, were negotiated under under severe duress, under conditions. But the Crown promised uh, to educate our people and it promised to clothe our women and our children. So we we acquiesced to the uh, last couple of treaties. Uh, so, but fortunately for us, one of our band members came to our rescue. That's this man here. His, his English name is the is a, is Peter Jones. Uh, I'm not even gonna, gonna, well, I'll try and pronounce it, but you're going to apologize. Uh, I will apologize in advance for my Ojibwe. I don't know it uh, very well. Kakawabanabi means uh, sacred feathers. And he's a man of interesting lineage. His father was Augustus Jones, the deputy provincial surveyor at the time. And Augustus I might add, was already married, and he decided to have a dalliance with the Mississauga of the Credit Woman by the name of Tuba Bananaque. Anyway, this dalliance uh, resulted in some offspring, an older boy, uh, John Jones, and the younger boy, Peter. And Augustus was not interested in raising the boys. He left them to be raised by his mother people, by his mother's people at the Credit River. And so they learned, uh, they learned everything you need to know to be a good First Nations boy. They learned boys, they learned how to hunt, fish, they knew the stories, the ceremonies, and everything you could possibly know. But for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Augustus had a pang of conscience. He knew the Mississaugas of the credit were 
in all likelihood going to be extinct. So he removed his boys from their mother's people and uh, brought them up with a settler education. So we, the boys, uh, the boys spent about 14 years living with their mother's people. And then they're taken away from the Credit River and get a settler education of, of uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, that sort of thing. And they both learn, uh, they both learn settler occupations. Uh, John, the older boy, learns how to become a surveyor. And Peter here learns how to become a brickmaker. Not exactly a robust job for a First Nations boy. But anyway, he decides one day to go to a camp meeting held by the Methodists. And you know those folks as the United Church people of uh, today. And uh, he goes to Ancaster to a camp meeting and he converts to Christianity. And he is a very enthusiastic convert. As you can tell, he becomes a missionary worker and then later on is ordained as a missionary, a full-blown Methodist, Methodist uh, missionary. And he decides that the way to save the Mississaugas from extinction is to convert them to Christianity and to give them an education, that reading, writing, arithmetic, and he's going to educate them in agriculture so that they can work on a level playing field with the settlers and they won't be taken advantage of. And by 1825, he succeeds beyond his wildest dreams. What's left of the Mississaugas, like I said earlier, about 200 of them, of, the, of us, convert to Christianity and readily convert to Christianity, I might add. They're not doing this. They're not forced to. They just do. They realize that the old ways are not working. And so they convert to Christianity and make the very conscious effort. And I will add, they're very, very, uh, how would I say it, enthusiastic converts. So with the help of the government, Peter Jones builds a mission village. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. I think that's what I'm looking at here. Yes, what builds a mission village on the Credit River. And there you're going to see the transformation of the Mississaugas of the Credit. 1826, this village is established. Prior to that, the people are the people are living off the land, hunting, fishing, gathering. And like I said, not doing a very good job of it because remember, they're, you know, they're, they're not able to move both the land as they once are. But now they transform all aspects of their lives. They go to this Christian mission village and they go to work. Uh, they learn they go to school. A school is quickly built. Remember, these are Christian Methodists. They have to read the Bible. Uh, so, so they read the Bible, they become literate, and the children lead the way. The children become very literate, and they are responsible for teaching the adults. Uh, uh, we, uh, we learn about agriculture. Before, we used to, uh, used, to build, uh, used to plant small plots of gardens outside our wigwams. Now we clear a couple thousand acres of land and we plant the crop, the cash crops of the day, oat, wheat, barley, uh, not the Indian crops of corn, beans, and squash. No, we're beyond that. Uh, we learn about business. We become the major shareholders of the Credit River Harbor Company and are responsible for building two piers out into the Credit uh, River. Uh, so that we can actually ship goods using our own schooner that we build from our own funds. Our village thrives. We have storehouses. We have mechanic shops. You know them today as carpenter shops, workshops, blacksmiths, shoemakers. Uh, we really transform our lives and make the conscientious effort to do so because we knew that was our key to survival. And... We, we prospered at that time. Matter of fact, our reserve, uh, our, our mission village was used as a model mission village for others. And many of our people actually went on and become missionaries and teachers and bring the gospel or the good religion, as we called it, to other First Nations in Ontario. It's really a golden age for our, uh, for our people. Sir Francis Bondhead, you know him, uh, the nasty little man that really did a large part to precipitate the uh, 
the rebellion of 1837 in Upper Canada. He did not believe First Nations could be civilized, but he came to visit us in uh, 1837 to inspect our village, and he was amazed when he visited our homes, because here we were living in these settler log cabin style homes. We he expected to find us living in skins. Uh, uh, sleeping on the floor on hides, but instead he finds us living in beds. We have books. We're having eating utensils. We have tables and chairs and shelves and all manner of things. We're dressed neatly, much like the settlers. And he actually is amazed. And so, uh, wonderful. We, we, I always like to point out we made that very conscious effort to uh, transform our lives. It's very noteworthy. I want to say this right now. Uh, uh, too, I want to I want to give a plug to Edgerton Ryerson of all people because I know he gets a lot of bad press nowadays. But uh, for our First Nation, he was he was good to us. He's our first missionary, and he teaches us. He teaches in our school. He teaches us how to farm. We even gave him the name uh, Chichok, which means, uh, I want to say bird on the move. Uh, I think bird on the wing is the best, because he was about our people. Uh, he was always moving about our people, and he rolled up his sleeves, and he worked with our people. He was not thundering from the pulpit telling us how to live our lives. He was actually out there showing us to so, showing us uh, showing us how to uh, to live the good way, and I, I always point this out because I think uh, he deserves some credit for the good he did at the at the uh, Credit uh, River Mission, and I always believe in giving credit where credit is uh, credit is due. Now uh, let's go to the next slide. I think we can. Okay, so that's just an I use it as to remind us how we dressed. Uh, we weren't in skins and uh, so on. Next line. Yeah, this is a schooner too. I always say we build schooners. We built a schooner with our own band funds so that we could trade along the wakes, uh, trade in the uh, timber along uh, in Lake Ontario. So very, very important for us because we, we knew that was the way to go to keep advancing. And we considered ourselves progressive and, uh, and, and that showed up with a schooner. Carry on one more slide I think I want to get to. Right, this is another view of one of our homes at uh, the Credit uh, River Mission Village. Even though we've improved our lot at the Credit River, we found that uh, we could not get title to our lands. And we were on a prime piece of real estate at the Credit River. Settlers wanted it. Uh, and like I said, it was a prime piece of a prime piece of real estate, and the settlers continued to converge on our our mission village to the to the point of trespass in many cases. And we also remember we're a Christian mission village. We found that the settlers uh, we found them a bit rude for our Methodist sensibilities, uh, uh, things that don't amount to much nowadays, like uh, you know. There was drinking, of course, that means something to us being Methodist, of course, swearing. Uh, we thought the settlers were bad examples for our children. Uh, we couldn't get title to our land. So even though we'd cleared the lands, we know there was demand and uh, demand for our lands. We all these things kind of wanted us. We, we really longed to go elsewhere. We could escape some of that settler influence. And we start looking around for other land. Uh, we look at Muncie Town near London, Ontario. We look at the Saugeen River, uh, especially Saugeen. Uh, we, we told the government of our plans to potentially move. and uh, But eventually we sent an advance party out to the Saugeen area in 1847. And uh, we found that the land was too rocky for us to move there. Uh, we learned how to become farmers, of course, and how can we how can we grow? How can we be wonderful farmers if the land is too rocky, if there's not enough groundwater? So that idea fell through, but the and uh, we said we said to the crown, we can't go there. Uh, so we're not going to move to the Saugeen. And the Crown said, well, you're going to have to move because we have decided to put the lands up at the Credit River Mission Village for auction and the settlers will be moving in. So we were in quite a quandary. Uh, what are we going to do? We're about to be 
homeless. We'd spent all the time improving the land, we'd build a prosperous mission village, we'd prospered ourselves, and now it was about to be snatched out from underneath of us. And indeed, it was snatched out, and we were going to be homeless. But now comes an interesting part of our story. Uh, switch slides, I believe, here. Wonderful. Uh, so remember at the end of the Beaver Wars, we drove out the Haudenosaunee and said, stay, stay below Lake Ontario, go back to New York State where you belong, your homeland there. Well, remember, we made Treaty Number no. 3, the Between the Lakes Treaty that enabled the Six Nations to uh, come to Southern Ontario. Well, in 1847, they heard that our lands were going to be taken from us. So they heard that we were going to be homeless. So they decided to make an offer of land to us and invited us to come and live on a corner of their uh, piece of land in Southern Ontario. And if you look, you can see the Six Nations, it's outlined in red in the middle of the Between the Lakes Treaty. And so we accepted their invitation. And in 1847, we arrived where we are today, just south of Hamilton, like I said, uh, right Hagersville, Ontario. And that's where we remain to this day. So uh, next slide, please. Wonderful. And this is what we move into and it's a bit of a disappointment but at least we're not homeless uh there are about uh, 250 of us moved from the credit river here to what we was termed new credit in 1847 4800 acres of land in brant 1200 acres of land in haldeman that we straddle and uh the main problem for us what we found so problematic was we're no longer living on the river. We're no, we've, we've lost our connection to water. Our, our land, uh, we're landlocked here. We have two small creeks that flow across the credit, uh, our, our land here, and both of them dry up or almost dry up in the summer. So there's no schooner, there's no mills, and we're alienated from, from the waters. And so that's problematic for our people. We are never able to replicate what we had at the Credit River Mission. We do build a church, of course, because we're still devout Methodists. We build a school because we very firmly believe in education. And we're great at farming yet. Uh, but uh, even that, the wheels fall off farming. Because remember, we move here, there's 250 of us. By the time we're here for another generation, the land has to be split amongst our children. And then by the time we're here for another 20 years, the land has to be split amongst our children again. And so pretty soon a family farm won't support a family. So that's a problem. The other problem is that there's always advances in agriculture, whether it's new farming equipment, whether it's a combine or cultivator or something. And the great thing about settlers is you can go to the bank and get a loan. Well, remember, we do not get title to our lands. We do not own our own land, so we can't go to the bank and get loans for new equipment that we might need. And so we fall far behind in agriculture. And as late as the 1920s and 1930s, uh, some of our people are still using horses. Uh, and so really that necess necessitates another, another, transformation in our lives. So many of our people have to go elsewhere to keep body and soul together. And that's indeed today. Uh, many of our people went to the nearby cities. Uh, this is in the early 19th century or the early 20th century. Uh, go to the nearby cities of Simcoe, Brantford, Hamilton, and so on. We spread out our people. And today, that's true today, in a population of 2,700 Mississaugas of the credit, only about a third of us actually live on our reserve here. Most of us have to go elsewhere. We're fairly well educated, but we have to go to go elsewhere uh, to make a living. Uh, we have doctors in our community. We have well, we have. Uh, you're going to meet him on, uh, I believe, Wednesday night. Uh, appellate court justice, uh, Justice Harry Laform. He's one of our band members. Had to go practice law elsewhere. I taught school 
uh, many years always outside the reserve because that's where I could get a job and make a living. Uh, like I said, we have doctors and nurses and everything, but we usually have to go elsewhere. Uh, one of the things I'm very pleased with, we even have a, an Australian senator in our band membership, a, a senator who went to practice journalism in uh, in Australia, ended up moving up through the uh, Australian political system, and uh, now he's a senator. So a problem that we have today, fairly well-educated people, but it's now that transforming again. So you've seen us go from hunters and gatherers to farmers to moving into industry, and now we're uh, moving on to, uh, to other things. Uh, I think, go to the next slide if I am not mistaken. Oh, wonderful. And so we've, we've came a long way from uh, wigwams on the banks of rivers. We still got lots, lots of transforming to do. And these are just some of the modern buildings we have at New Credit today. We have an energy company. We have an economic development company. And we're always looking to better our lot. And one of the most exciting things that we were involved in not too long ago, uh, I'm sure you folks in Toronto know all about uh, Sidewalk Labs, and uh, they had this major project uh, underway to, uh, I would say, to Googleize, uh, to Googleize some of the Toronto waterfront. And that was a project between with the Waterfront Toronto, you know, the federal government, the provincial government, and, uh, uh, you know, the city. And uh, we were involved in that, uh, in those project, in that project, uh, because as treaty holders, uh, there, there, there is a recognition that they're incumbent to, uh, they're bound to uh, recognize our interests in our treaty lands and territory and talk to us about projects that go on. And so I was very proud of our people that we could uh, participate in, the, in, the, in those uh, talks. And uh, unfortunately, it, it fell through uh, the deal for whatever reason. But I like to say we're always transforming. We're resilient people after all these years. Uh, so I'm almost out of time, but I just want to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, let's see what the next slide is because Okay, uh, I just point out we do have a water claim against the Crown. Uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but all of our treaties never signed away our right to water. They're all, all blank about uh, water, except one, and that's because the British wanted to build a bridge across the Credit River. So there's one treaty that does mention water, but the rest of them are all silent. So in 2016, one of the major claims we have against the uh, provincial government and the, and the federal government is for a water claim, where we claim unextinguished Aboriginal title to uh, all the floodplains uh, and the waters within our uh, treaty lands and territory. And you can see it's kind of an unprecedented claim, but uh, in 2016, uh, we'll see. We haven't heard back from the government on it. It's a long process, but we're a patient people. Remember how I told you about the Toronto purchase uh, purchase uh, treaty, how long it took from uh, 1986 to uh, 2010 to get, get that settled? Well, this probably will take us a while too. But uh, carry on, next slide. Uh, before, I want to end today uh, because I know there's always questions about uh, uh, it's always uh, questions when we give these talks, especially in light of uh, residential schools and all the other things that, uh, all the other problems between, uh, the, between the government and First Nations and settler and First Nations relationships and so on. I always get asked, what about reconciliation? And so I want to want to finish up just a, a bit about that today, and I'm just going to say that there's no easy answer. There's no quick way to resolve this issue. There's no crystal ball. We know it must go forward for the good of both peoples, both First Nations and settler folks. We know we must go forward. But where it's going to end up, I don't know. And I think a talk like we're having with Massey College today is important because it lets and gives people a very, very brief overview of our people and about the treaty making process. There's just so much to talk about, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a saying, we're all treaty people and we are. I didn't like that phrase. It 
first because it was also trite, but really those treaties endure to this very day. And the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation still, in the spirit of those treaties, want to share the land. And we're sharing the land. And it took us a while back in the very, very early days to realize that we weren't sharing anymore. But here we are in the 20th, 21st century, actually, still desiring to live according to the spirit of those treaties. And we want very much to do that, even to this very day. So we're very glad to see that there's land acknowledgments nowadays, and there is a recognition of the treaty lands and territory of the First Nation. We love to see we're natural allies in this wise stewardship of lands, waters, and resources. And I'm glad to see, I think the First Nation is glad to see that we're working together on those things. And we have to remember, respect and honor the First Nations, and that's a mutual friendship. I like this two row wampum belt to illustrate that. It's not a belt originated originating with the Mississaugas of the credit. The we've adopted as many Great Lakes First Nations have even First Nations outside the Great Lakes region. One purple string of wampum in there represents the uh, a settler a settler sailing ship. The other one represents an indigenous canoe. And they're both share uh, sailing along in parallel down a river. And uh, the the it was supposed to be that we were not going to interfere First Nations and settlers with one another, that we would each carry on with our own lives and go about independently. Well, we know that's not true. We've interacted with each other plenty, and it always hasn't been uh, an equitable relationship. Uh, it's, it's not always been a fair relationship. Uh, and so... The important thing, I think, is not to remember that so much, but to remember the, if you look closely, you'll see three beads of wampum in between these two purple strips. And those be, three beads represent peace, friendship, and respect. And that's why I like this tree. If we as Indigenous people, as First Nations, if we as as First Nations people and settlers can come together in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect, then we can do much together. But both sides have to conscientiously work at it. And uh, that's why I think talks like this is, are so valuable. We have to walk along the path of reconciliation. That's true. But we have to get to know each other well. and. Uh, and so if we can come together with peace, respect, and friendship, we can do much. And who knows where reconciliation will, will lead us. I certainly don't know. I'm not sure the government of Canada knows. But I think there is tremendous possibility and hope when we talk and not just pay lip service to... Uh, notions of uh, reconciliation. Now, I'm going to leave it there today. I've almost I went seven minutes past my time, and I've never learned how to cut this talk off early, but that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to leave it there today and say, Meg Witch, for your very, very uh, kind attention. And I hope you learn about us. I hope you've learned something about us. I hope you take time to ask questions of us and interact with First Nations and come to understand us as the treaty holders of this land, the people that helped enable the settlement of Toronto and indeed the greater, uh, the greater uh, Golden Horseshoe. So thank you very much. And I will leave it there. Jimmy Gwich. Jimmy Gwich, uh, uh, Darren Mombaka, what a wonderful uh, overview of this story. We want to continue to talk and we have to continue to listen to this great story. This is the only way to get to truth is to listen to one another. Thank you so much. Miigwech.